Hi, welcome to chapter three. In this chapter, we're going to talk about the securities market, um, <clears throat> short selling, margin. So we've got a couple good topics here to talk about in this chapter. So first, let's start out with the primary and secondary marketplace. Okay, so the primary market, uh, which is a market which firms and governments are going to sell new securities to investors. So this is the birth of a lot of these securities. So in the primary market, the issuer of the equity or debt securities is gonna receive uh, the proceeds of the sale. So if a company is gonna issue stock in the primary market, <clears throat> they can get money for the sale. So um, now, so to sell securities in the primary market, a firm has three choices. One, uh, public offering, in which the firm offers its securities for sale to public investors. Two, a rights offering, in which a firm uh, offers shares to existing shareholders at a um, new rate. So each outstanding shareholder would get an equal proportion of shares to maintain their ownership uh, percentage. Or three, a private placement, in which the firm sells securities directly without any SEC regulations. Now, the secondary market is when somebody who owns the stock has the ability to sell it to another party. So this is sort of like if you have bought a video game brand new and then you want to trade it in and somebody else is going to buy it used from a store, this is like the secondary market. So the manufacturer of the software doesn't receive any money if you sell a copy of your game used or you sell a copy of a book used or you sell a copy of a, uh, a movie, DVD used. So the secondary market is where people can trade their stocks and bonds. <clears throat> and the issuer doesn't receive any money when stocks and bonds are traded. However, if there's a lot of demand on the buy side of this, it can push the stock prices up. And if the stock, the firm that issued the stock actually has any shares they own, which would be called treasury stock, they could get a boost from just, you know, the value of the stock going up. But they're not going to make any money from the trading of stock. Okay, moving on, let's look at the privately held and publicly held. Um, so like I was saying before, private placement, it, it, this is where firms sell shares directly without SEC regulations to a select group, it, group of private investors such as insurance companies, investment bank funds, pension funds, maybe hedge funds. Uh, now, publicly traded, of course, you know, one of the better known ways to access the primary market is through initial public offering or what's known as an IPO. So this is the sale of stock publicly uh, and it's converting the firm from a private to a public ownership. And that's a big deal and it's very expensive and time consuming. That's why investment banks are usually brought in to help with this process. Uh, now, in this process of IPOs is, is part of a timing. So you want to become public when the market is ready to and excited to buy your shares. So you don't want to become public during a bear market or a recession. You usually want to come public during the, uh, the high of a bull market is usually when you get the most, the highest price for your stock and the best return. Uh, so that's why IPOs fell dramatically during the Great Depression, during the Great Recession, during the dot-com crash. Um, so the IPO is relative uh, to the economic uh, expansion as far as reaching a peak. Now, even Google, as great as that company was, they delayed their uh, launch until better economic times. And same with Facebook. Okay. So if you're privately held, the way it's defined in the U.S. is that ownership by a small group of investors, and you're, you're only allowed to have up to 2,000 shareholders, and that's been recently increased. So you're, you have, as a privately held company, you have fewer obligations and less regulation. You don't have to answer to the SEC. Um, and you can, you know, so it's, so I personally, when I worked uh, in finance and accounting, I preferred to work for privately owned firms because the paperwork was so much easier. When a company is publicly traded, now the, it's public, so you can have unlimited number of shareholders, but your obligations for your auditing, your SEC filings, your accounting statements are much higher and come under much more scrutiny. Okay, so 
like I was saying before, these publicly traded companies, this is when you're first going to offer sales and become um, the IPO is when you first offer shares and officially become public. So there's a process to how this IPO uh, is going to work. <clears throat> and it's a little, um, we're not going to go into 100% of the nitty gritty details here, but we're going to talk about uh, some key things here. Now, the most companies that go public are usually pretty small, fast growing companies that are going to require additional capital to expand. So think of uh, Chipotle Mexican Grill 10 years ago, they were a much smaller company, they went public, they used the funds from the public shares to uh, greatly expand the number of locations they had. It, um, you can also look at, if you're familiar with Dropbox, this is another company, they raised about $756 million when they went public in March of 2018. And that was money they're going to use to buy servers, advertising, expand their offering, expand their functionality, and you know make hopefully make the company um, more attractive uh, to investors by growing sales and profits. Um, so you know large companies may decide to spin off a unit um, of their company to a separate corporation. You know um, Hilton did this when they spun off a timeshare business, the Hilton Grand Vacations in 2017. So that's another way of creating a new, new set of shares of stock is if a company spins off a piece of their company, sort of like a TV show creating a spin-off, uh, creating a whole new TV show, uh, sort of like you know the Big Bang Theory creating uh, Young Sheldon. It sort of works like that. It's from an origin point, but it's a whole new entity on its own. So when a company decides to go public, um, it first must obtain the approval of the shareholders the current shareholders when they're in a private state. So in investors who own it privately, uh, they have their own stock. So private companies have stock too. It's just you can't buy it as a public person. You have to wait for the company to go public. So next, the company's auditors and lawyers are going to certify that the financial documents and financial statements uh, for the company are legitimate. Uh, the bank who's, who's going to be the lead underwriter is going to be responsible for promoting the company stock and facilitating the sale of the IPO shares. So that's going to be an investment bank. And the lead underwriter, um, they're going to they're going to bring in other investment banks to help underwrite the market, which means they want to help sell the stock as broadly as possible. So this is the role of the investment bank in, they have a much bigger role in this whole thing. Okay, so the underwriter who's gonna assist the company in filing the registration statement uh, with the SEC, and that's a very big undertaking, very complex. So you need to hire an investment bank to really, they have all the shortcuts, they have all the work figured out. Um, you might hear a cat meowing, that's my cat, Barb. Uh, and she likes to interrupt when I'm recording because she thinks I'm talking to her. So just, if you hear me out, just ignore it. Uh, <clears throat> so now, the, with the underwriters, one portion of, of these statements is going to be the prospectus. So the prospectus, this is the disclosure document that describes the key aspects of the security that's going to be issued. So the issuer's management and the issuer's financial position is all going to be described in this document. So among other pertinent information, the perspective provides potential investors with a list of associated risk factors, so those related to the issuer's business specifically and industry. <clears throat> for example, it may talk about the opportunities for growth, uh, compensation um, you know, uh, for its uh, executives, um, competition for market share. So the company filing is going to include registration statements that can be freely accessible. Uh, they're on... You know, for the U.S. government, they're on www.sec.gov, and once a firm files a perspective with the SEC, it begins a quiet period, where during this, uh, the firm has a lot of restrictions as far as what they can communicate to investors to keep things fair, because they don't want to give out information uh, after they release the prospectus. So they're going to be waiting for the SEC approval, and then once they receive the approval, uh, um, then they can go ahead and start the in motion offering of the public stock. So now there's something called a preliminary perspective is going to cover the preliminary um, aspects of the company. And, you know, it's all sort of just in the name of trying to get the information out there to investors. 
So uh, let's continue here with the with the road show. So during the registration period and before the IPO date, the investment banks and companies or executives are going to promote the company stock through a roadshow, well, which, which is going to be a series of presentations to potential investors, typically institutional investors around the country, sometimes international, uh, in, 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 in addition to providing investors with information about the new uh, issue of stock. Roadshows help the investment banks to gauge the demand of the offering and helps an expectation for what the price range might be. So uh, in the middle, uh, you're gonna, they're going to help figure out the, what the initial price range is going to be set at. So the preliminary perspective has uh, two blank placeholders, and they're going to be um, where the eventual range of the price offer, offering will be listed because they, they have to see what kind of interest there is, and the more interest there is, the higher they can price the IPO. And that's in the benefits of the company's interest because the more money they receive when it's actually released. Um, so when the final offer price is set, uh, all the shares will be sold in the primary market and the SEC has to approve the final perspective before, um, for the offering before the IPO can take place. Now, so think of the roadshow sort of like, um, say a big movie is coming out. And you're going to see the stars of the movie going on talk shows and hitting all the talk shows to promote the movie to get as big as as big as they can opening box office. So that's what the road show is basically related to. It's it's drumming up interest and demand for the IPO because the investment bank who underwrites means they're usually responsible for selling all the shares um, as part of their contract. And one and one of the reasons they're paid such big flotation charges is because they're going to get this sold. In order to do that, typically the investment bank will underprice the uh, initial offering maybe by 10% or more because they want to uh, have the stock price pop up the first day and they want to please all the shareholders and the institutional investments they sold it to. So uh, now the company, they want to fight and keep the underpricing at a minimum because they want to receive as much money as possible. So for a company point of view, if a stock comes out and it goes up 50% the first day, they're going to feel like this, that the stock was very underpriced and they could have received a lot more money in the IPO and still had a 10% or 15% um, pop up that first day. So these are things that uh, companies have to be aware of, that the investment bank is looking out not only for the company's interest, but for their interest and for the, the underwriting syndicate they're associated with. So there's a lot of um, back and forth negotiating about this underpricing. Okay, so let's move on. All right, so here is, let's talk about the overall process of this underwriting syndicate and you know how that's gonna work out. So. The selling process for, this is the selling process, say, for a large security. So the lead um, investment bank is going gonna, is gonna to be hired by the firm directly. And the, so this investment bank is then going to form what's called an underwriting syndicate. So the underwriting syndicate buys the entire security issue from the corporation selling the stock with, at an agreed upon discount to the public offering price. And this is the money they're going to make the difference between the discount and what it's sold in, in the marketplace. So the investment banks and the underwriting syndicate are going to bear the risk of reselling the security to the public through the public offering, meaning that if they don't sell all the shares, they're going to have to buy them themselves. So the investment bank's profit is going to be the difference between the price they're guaranteed by the issuer uh, and the public offering price. Uh, so both the lead investment bank and the other syndicated members are going to put together a selling group to sell the uh, issue on a commission basis to investors. So the selling group is going to include a um, bunch of uh, insurance companies, international in mutual fund companies, pension funds, uh, only the biggest players. In fact, you as a small investor have no access to an IPO. You have to wait till it's initially released to buy an IPO on the first day it trades, which is often at significantly higher prices. So let's look at here's some here's a chart on the initial average initial returns for U.S. and European and non-European IPOs. So the average first day returns you see interesting enough Greece is pretty high and here uh, Jordan is pretty high with uh, Denmark interestingly here is around eight percent and the U.S. Well, these are all uh, sorry in uh, these United States here is about. I guess it's close to 
uh, Finland is a little bit higher, <clears throat> and then it goes up. So this is just how their IPO markets work, and they have their own different, each country may have uh, different investment banks they're working with and different protocols, so um, they're going to have different average first day returns depending on where the, the stock is going to be issued, who the investment bank is, what the, uh, the deal is between the investment bank and the shareholders. So let's take a moment to look at Security Rule 415. So the Rule of 415, this is was introduced in 1982, and basically the security needs to be pre-registered with the SEC, um, offered at any time within the new, next two years. So once they file for their um, pre-registration, they have two years until they go public, and they have 24-hour notice for any or all pre-registered amounts that are going to be offered. So it's just a, it's just a um, a rule for 415 gives the firm an option. Uh, of a time horizon. So they have two years so they can kind of perfect their timing of when they're going to issue the IPO because they want to issue the IPO when the market is hungriest for it so they get the highest overall offer price. And it's very important for the company to get a higher offer price so they can use that more, they get more money to help grow the company. And they get more money for the percentage of ownership they're selling in the company. And that's the other thing you need to realize when the company delivers an IPO such as FedEx a number of years ago, they didn't sell 100% of their company to the public. They only went to about 15% of the company that they sold. And they have the other percentages they can do a follow-on uh, issuance of stock later on. Okay, so let's move into um, how securities are traded. So we're going to look at um, you know a couple of things here as far as how securities are traded, and you know the overall. Overall purpose is facilitate a low cost investment. So it's we're looking to bring whether depending on how you want to do it, there's a couple of different options of how the security markets do it. But by and large, they want to bring together buyers and sellers together at a low transactional costs, and and they want to provide uh, hopefully provide liquidity to make more efficient trading. So minimize the trade time, promote uh, some price. Um, continuity, uh, set and update pricing of financial assets and reduce you know, uh, informational costs with investors. So that's sort of the idea behind the purpose behind financial markets. So let's, uh, we're gonna talk about um, broker and dealer markets, uh, auction markets, direct search markets. Um, so these are things that we're gonna talk about. So first, let me just move ahead here. Okay, so let's just hold back. Okay, so let's just talk about a couple of, um, of these things here. So let's start with um, broker and dealer markets. So now, historically, the secondary market has been divided in, into these two segments uh, based on how securities are going to be traded or what exchange are going to be traded on. And that's going to be either the broker market or the dealer market. Now for you as an investor, it's it's of no difference to you because when you place an order through your broker, you're not going to necessarily know what the organization of the, um, the market is. And it's not going to affect you at all because for you as an investor, all you need to know is what is the bid price and what is the ask price. And, and then however that's derived is going to happen behind the scenes. So this is really behind the scenes mechanics of the market place that you don't necessarily have to worry about too much. Uh, but it's, I guess it's as a student in finance, you should know how this works. So, um, so it's important to understand that probably the biggest difference of the two markets is just a technical point dealing with the ways you know, the trades are handled. So most broker markets are actually broker-dealer markets in the sense that they're executing trades um, uh, for the market makers. Now, security dealers... Um, now, when we look at the security dealers that make the markets by offering a, uh, a buy and a sell a certain amount of securities uh, at the stated prices, m this is sort of, they must act as a broker first when the public orders are available to provide the liquidity and a dealer second. So the dealer, basically think of it as like the broker is making the market, the dealer is making the profit, is how I see it. So when there's no public orders to provide uh, liquidity, then the market maker has to act as a broker on the two sides um, 
to uh, facilitate the transaction. So the buyer and seller are brought together and the seller sells his or her shares directly to the buyer. So in certain cases, to keep the market liquid, they, um, the market maker is going to step in with their own inventory. So most dealer markets technically are what we call dealer broker markets in the sense that when they execute trades, the market makers can act as dealers first whenever it suits uh, them. So it's a slight difference there to provide the liquidity. So as a broker and then act as a broker second. So, so it's just a little semantics there. So whenever it doesn't suit them to provide liquidity, they can kind of act as a broker to facilitate the market. So if a market maker in a dealer market receives an order he or she does not want to execute, he or she can simply route the order along to another market maker for execution. So for example, if a market maker, they might route an order to a broker market, uh, essentially the two separate trades are made. So the seller sells security, for example, you may say Intel, to a dealer, and then the buyer buys the security, the stock of Intel, from another or possibly even the same dealer. Thus, there is always a dealer market maker, so a dealer we can think of as a market maker, uh, on one side and a dealer market of the transaction. So, um, so the broker market, uh, think of it as third-party assistant in locating a buyer and seller, and it's sort of like a broker for a real estate house. The dealer market, so they can act as the uh, intermediate buyer and seller, so they can actually get involved in the transaction. So those are the two subtleties that we're trying to explain. Now, an auction market, uh, think of eBay, sort of an auction market is where broker and dealers trade in one location, uh, and trading is more or less continuous, so it's sort of like a trading floor. Um, now, direct search markets are where buyers and sellers are going to locate one, and one, and one or another directly and sell directly to each other, um, and this is less typical. Okay, so let's move it on here, and let's go to the market order. So what is the market order? So a market order is a buyer-sell order that is executed immediately at the current market prices. Um, so this is basically you go to the, the, your, your broker and you put in the order and it's executed at the best possible price uh, that's offered. So the bid and ask, now these are, these are what's going to be offered in the, in the market order. So the ask price is what you're going to pay as, as someone buying the stock or it's what the dealer is going to sell the stock at, and the ask price is higher. The bid price is the price at which you can sell your stock at, or what the dealer is going to buy the security at. So how this works is the ask price is always higher than the bid price, and the difference between the ask and the bid is going to be a spread. And the person making the market, or the dealer, is going to get that spread as part of his compensation for facilitating the trade. So this kind of stinks, because say a stock has an ask of seven, and a bid of $6.75, which means that if you buy the stock at seven, the ask price, and then a few seconds later you turn around to sell the stock at the bid, you're immediately losing 25 cents on the transaction plus commission, plus commission charges. So even though the stock price hasn't changed, you, if you buy and sell initially back to back like that, you're gonna lose the spread because the market maker makes the spread. And that's sort of the incentive for them to make the market. It's the whole reason they're there. So, but a market order is similar to if you go to a store and you just buy something off the shelf, you go to the register and you pay whatever the current price of it is. Now we also have what we call price contingent orders, such as a limit order or a stop loss order. Now, let's, let me see if this continues in the next slide. Okay, it does, so we'll, so let me just explain a limit order and you can put a limit order on a buy or sell order because uh, you're going to put a specific price at which you're going to buy and sell the order. So, for example, it'd be like going into the supermarket and you want to buy some chocolate milk um, and you go up to the register and you say, Hi, um, I see the price of this chocolate milk is, um, you know, two euros. I would like to pay um, 1.5 euros for it. That's my, my limit on the buy. And the cashier will say, will say uh, okay, no, it's, it's, it's 
And so you wait there until um, you're going to hold that order, that limit order, until the price actually goes down to 150, and then you're going to buy your chocolate milk. If the price never goes down to 150, you have a specific time frame. So you could have a fill or kill limit order, which is just going to ask once, or you could have a, a limit order that's going to be standing for a number of days until the price actually falls to where you wouldn't buy it or sell it at. Now, a stop order is another type of order that's more like uh, insurance. So you want, you want to say, I already own the stock. I bought it at $50. It went up to $100. And I want to put a stop order um, sell at, say, $80. So if at any point the stock drops down to $80, it will sell, locking in a $30 profit for you. Now, so in the conditions, if we look at this, it says a uh, price falls below the limit. So if you put a limit order in to buy, your limit order um, is going to buy if the price falls to or below the limit. Uh, and if you have a stop loss order, that's going to execute. Now, if the price rises above the limit order, your limit order is not going to execute if the price is higher than your limit, uh, unless uh, it's a sell limit order. So you have to really look at the direction you are on the exchange as far as how, when, how, how, when your order is going to fill. So let me just back this. Let me, let me just give you a little bit more back, background on this because it may confu be confusing if you haven't actually traded any stock. So this is why if you play the um, stock trading games I set up for this course, it can help you to learn this a lot better if you participate in a stock trading game. Now, so let's go back to a market order. Okay, so a market order is the easiest to understand. So it's going, you're going to put an order in to buy or sell a stock at the best price available at the time the order is going to be executed. So that's a market order. So it's the quickest way to get an order filled because it's just like going into a store, picking up a piece, a product, and going to the cash register, register and paying for it. So market orders are quick and fast and execute uh, within seconds. Now, a limit order, uh, this is an order to buy at or below a specific price. So I would use a limit order if I'm afraid that me placing the order would jump the price of the stock higher than I want to pay. So sometimes if there's a low inventory, I put an order in for buy a thousand shares. Once they use up, the market maker uses up 500 pieces of the inventory, he'll move the ask price up and thereby I could be paying a lot more than I expected uh, on a market order. So if I put a limit order in, he's, I'm, I'm limiting the market maker to only buy or sell the stock for me at the price I specify. Um, so it works both ways, a buy or a sell. So it's basically limiting the price the broker can or the market maker can do in selling or buying the security for you. So it gives you more control. So you can specifically say what the price is you want to buy and sell a stock at, and they won't buy and sell a stock at any price other than what you're specifically set in the limit order. Um, so the market maker is going to make a note of the shares and the price in the limit order in his book for execution. And then when it actually meets the qualifications of the limit order, the uh, mark the order will fill. Uh, now, when you set up a limit order, you can set up what's called a fill a fill or kill order, which means it's going to be um, if it's not executed, it's going to be canceled immediately. You can also set the limit order up to be a day order, which means it'll last for the entire trading day, or what's called a GTC, a good to cancel, which is going to be remaining in effect for anywhere from 30 to 90 days unless it executes. So that's an, an important aspect. Um, uh, if your broker offers these options, not every broker does. Now, keep in mind that if you execute a limit order or a stop order, you're going to pay more than a market order as far as commissions go. So these limit orders can be very effective from, um, you know, keeping you from making a large mistake that's out of your control. So, uh, so say you want to buy um, a stock at $30 or less and the stock price moves to $30.50 at the time you place the order, the stock is at $30.50 and the price moves up to 42. Uh, so you miss the opportunity to make that, that profit on that stock. So sometimes putting a limit in at 30 is gonna prevent you from buying a stock that maybe it never went below $30.50 and now it's trading a few hours later at 42. So a limit order can also hinder your returns because it could prevent you from getting in at a, at a reasonable price because you put a very specific price on. Now a stop loss order uh, now, this is when an investor is going to place, you know, what we call a stop loss order or a stop order. 
and the broker tells the broker's going to tell the market maker um, to sell the stock when the market reaches or drops to a price below a specific level, thereby protecting you. So say you bought a stock for five dollars a share and now it's trading at seven hundred dollars a share, and in if bad news comes out, it could drop down to under $100 a share. So if it's trading at $700 a share, you can put a stop loss in at $600 a share. So if something happens, if the market crashes or the bad news is released, you'll get out early because you put the stop loss order in to automatically trade for you. Uh, so basically, these stop loss orders are, are suspended orders placed on stocks that are only activated when the stock reaches a particular price level. So the stop loss order is placed on the market maker's books and it becomes active once the stock reaches that price. So like a market order, the stop loss orders are typically, um, could be a day order or could be a good to cancel. So when activated, the stop loss order becomes a market order and it's gonna sell the security the best price available at that time. So even though you put it in at 600, you might get 599 or 598 because it's just, that stop is just gonna activate the order and then it's gonna go for what the next possible best price is for you. All right. Okay, and it's kind of confusing until you actually start trading, and that's why I recommend setting up a, um, a fixed, you know, a trading game or a brokerage account where you're able to trade with um, a simulation of trade, so you can get the hang a handle of how this works. And those simulations work on the actual share prices; it's just not you're not trading with real money. So, um, okay, so I'm gonna pass these examples because I kind of went over this pretty well okay so let's let's go back to the trading mechanics so we talked earlier about these markets so let's look at a dealer market and see how that is how that works okay so let's talk about the dealer market the dealer markets are part of the over-the-counter market um, and the over-the-counter market is uh, pretty big so the over-the-counter market is a dealer's market and within the over-the-counter market we have the Nasdaq which is probably the um, the the most well-known segment of the over-the-counter market. So a dealer market, a key feature of the dealer market is that it has no centralized trading floors. So when you see the New York Stock Exchange on the news and all the traders in the floor, that's um, a broker market, not a dealer market. So there's no uh, actual floor where traders are trading stock. Instead, the, the market makers are linked together in a communication network, a lot like the internet. So each market maker is actually a securities dealer who, who's going to make a market for one or more securities by offering the buy or sell stock at a specific stated bid or ask price. So the investor is, you know, who pays the ask price when buying security is going to receive the bid price when selling them. So the, the, the two most recognizable dealer markets are, of course, the NASDAQ, and all, uh, and which is an all-electronic trading platform that was established uh, way back over 40, 50 years ago, before the internet was even around. Um, and it's used to execute uh, security trades over in, in the over-the-counter market. So investors, um, you know, trade smaller, unlisted securities. Uh, it, it, the over-the-counter market isn't as well known as, say, the New York Stock Exchange. So together, the, the two dealer markets account for 25% of all shares traded in, say, the United States. And the NASDAQ accounts for the overwhelming majority of these trades in the over-the-counter market. Um, so it's just, to you, you, as you're buying and selling a stock, you're not gonna care what market's in, or if it's a dealer or broker, you're not gonna notice. But it's just some behind-the-scenes semantics of these two types of markets developed in tandem to, uh, to two different markets, the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ, primarily. Um, now the non, the Nasdaq stock market, and this is you know of course the largest dealer market. And it's made up of a large list of stocks that are listed and traded on what we call the. It's an acronym. The Nasdaq is an acronym for National Association of Security Dealers Automatic Quotation System. So companies like Google and which is Alphabet, um, Netflix, uh, these are traded on the the. Uh, Nasdaq, so the big, usually the bigger technology companies like Intel. So now, so the Nasdaq is sort of born over, out of the over-the-counter market, and it's considered, you know, a separate entity. No longer really, um, we consider it almost separate than from the over-the-counter market because it is so formalized now with its own set of regulations or rules to how to be listed. Um, 
And you know, the NASDAQ is at the same prestige level as the New York Stock Exchange at this point because so many of the small technology companies have grown into big behemoth technology companies. So to be traded on the NASDAQ, the stocks have to have at least two market makers uh, to make a market. And the bigger, more actively stocks, like say Amazon, which is also on the NASDAQ, is going to have many more market makers than that, maybe 30 market makers, who are all going to be competing to sell to you. And you, when you place an order, they're going to marry you up with who's ever offering the best ask price. So that way, that competitive nature between the market makers helps to keep the market efficient um, to the uh, buying and selling supply and demand of the share prices. Um, and the NASDAQ has usually has around 1,500 stocks traded and it's a pretty active uh, and well-noted uh, stock market. So let's talk about the what's called an ECN. So what is an ECN? So an ECN is basically a uh, electronic communications network. It's so it's an automated. It's another automated computer-based trading system that a lot electronically is going to execute orders by matching or crossing the buyers and sellers. Uh, orders for um, different securities. Now, it's going to allow individual traders to trade directly with each other, so the ECN eliminates the dealer function and payment of the bid ask spra- uh, spread. So, if it, so you basically two people just come together. This is just this ECN is just going to marry a, a buyer and seller together, and there's no actual spread or bid and ask. They just agree to a price that they want to pay. So the ECN displays the best available bid ask prices for multiple. Um, market participants and then automatically matches executes the order at the midpoint of the bid and ask spread so there's no spread to be earned by because there's no dealer or market maker so um, if it can't be matched then it's um, not going to be executed so this is a much smaller exchange it's a more efficient for high volume large uh, key players to exchange shares after hours so this is typically an after hours market so it's, it can, it's considered an alternative trading uh, a platform by the SEC, and it requires no registered brokers or dealers. Um, so it's sort of you know unique. The ECNs generally save customers money because their orders are going to be crossed, eliminating any any uh, spreads that they would have paid uh, to a dealer. So while now many you know small customers, you're not going to access the ECN. This is for really large institutional customers like money managers, mutual fund managers, pension fund managers, who are going to want to be connected and trade in this after hours market. And the liquidity is pretty low, and the amount of stocks offered isn't as um, available. You know, um, so now a specialty when we talk about specialty markets. So specialty markets are, are a system that largely replaces the electronic communications network, but has, you know, recently, as two decades ago, were still one of the most important means at which stocks were traded. So in these systems, exchanges such as the New York Stock Exchange assign res- responsibility for managing and trading in each uh, security to a specialist. So the uh, brokers wishing to buy and sell shares for their client, uh, clients directly the trade to the specialist is posted in the floor of the exchange. While each security is assigned to only one specialist, each specialist makes a market in many securities. So the specialist maintains the limit book order and all the outstanding executions of the limit orders. So when market orders are executed, um, they're going to be executed through the specialist. Uh, who are going to cross the trade. So really, it's just a specialist is somebody assigned the responsibility of organizing and managing the marketplace. And this is, you know, something you would see in not a, um, you wouldn't see it in a dealer market. This is more of a broker market. You would see this. Okay, so let's talk about the rise of electronic um, trading a little bit in this next segment here. So over 50 years ago, the um, Instanet, the first ECN, is established. 1975, the SEC decides to uh, eliminate the fixed commissions from the New York Stock Exchange. So now, back in the 70s, commissions were, in inflation adjustment, adjusted terms, could be hundreds of dollars. So commissions were fixed by the SEC, who stated what and how much brokers could charge. So when they eliminated this, uh, allowed for different networks um, to expand and decide 
what they would charge for commissions. And this is what also led the way for discount brokers like Fidelity and Charles Schwab. So the, a Congress amends the Securities Exchange Act and creates the national market system. This, this is what is going to become the, uh, is going to be incorporated into the NASDAQ. Now, later on in 94, there is a, a scandal with the NASDAQ and the way they're handling orders. So the SEC develops new order handling rules to make it less prone to um, any foul play. And the NASDAQ integrates ECN quotes directly into their display. And the SEC adopts regulations for alternative trading systems like ECN. So giving the ability to register stock and other exchanges. So basically over the last 50 years, the SEC has loosened up regulation and allowed for more alternative trading platforms to exist. And that helps to um, facilitate the trading of stocks. Now, um, in 1997, the SEC drops the minimum tick size from one eighth to one sixteenth of a dollar, so it allows spreads to get even closer. In 2000, the Nasdaq, um, you know, the splits from the National Association of Security Dealers to become more independent. The minimum tick price in 2001 uh, falls down to one cent. So what happened here is they they went from using a system of fractions, which is really old system using quoting stocks in, you know, six and a half, six and three fourths, six and the eighth, uh, to de um, a, a decimalization. So now stocks would be quoted in um, dollars and cents. Um, so that way you could bring down the minimum tick to one penny and the minimum spread to one cent as well. And that made the markets a lot uh, more affordable as spreads. Uh, reduced quite uh, by quite a bit. And then 2006, the NASDAQ acquires Archipelago Exchanges and renames it uh, NYSE, ARCA. And then in the Security Exchange adopts regulation uh, NMS, requiring exchanges to honor uh, quotes on other exchanges, uh, thereby furthermore connecting them. So you can see here in this particular chart, we're looking at the, the, the effective spread versus the minimum tick. So when they did, when they used to quote stocks in no smaller than one eighth, so it would be one eighth, two eighth, three eighth, four eighth, five eighth, you know, uh, and they went to the 16th, this, this started to be reduced. And you can see periods of high, um, these peaks are really during financial crises is where the, the, the spreads really um, start to spread apart as the market becomes a little bit unbalanced. And then when, when around the year 2000, we went to decimalization, you can see that the overall effective spread versus and the minimum tick um, becomes much lower, which makes the market more efficient and more affordable. So we're basically paying smaller spreads uh, in these markets over this time. So let's talk about the, um, in the US stock markets, we have of course the NASDAQ, which depending on your, your point of time frame. Um, today, this has approximately 3,000 firms, uh, but a lot of mergers and acquisitions and companies going private has greatly reduced that number. And I think, you know, it's actually a little bit closer to, um, so it's somewhere between 1,500 and 3,000, which I think is more closer to 1,500. Uh, and so this is the biggest um, market maker type of uh, environment. So, you know, a couple of interesting things about the, Na the NASDAQ, it's a dealer market and it's made up of, you know, a large list of some well-known stocks and it was, began operations or started to be referred to as the NASDAQ in 1971 and it's, you know, closely related to um, the over-the-counter market, which is where it sort of, where it sort of was born from and you have, you know, pretty high profile stocks like before I had mentioned Amazon as one of them. Now, the New York Stock Exchange is probably the most prestigious stock exchange uh, as far as the big stock exchanges, and it's also known as the big board. So New York Stock Exchange um, is, by some accounts, the largest exchange in the world as far as total dollars exchanged, maybe not by number of stock exchanges. It has more than 25% of the total dollar volume of all trades in the U.S. market. In 2018, uh, more than 2,800 uh, firms um, were listed on the exchange with a value of 20, almost $30 trillion. 
Uh, it's, I think it probably was up to almost 40 trillion in the latest peak in 2000. So before the New York Stock Exchange became, you know, for profit, uh, uh, publicly traded company in 2006, an individual or firm had its um, basically had a seat on the, on the New York Stock Exchange and became a member of the exchange. And then the seat would enable that you to access the exchange and offer um, trading or secure or, or have um, a uh, the seating exchange gave you access to the exchange. So if you're a big broker, you needed to have a seat exchange to have access to the New York stock market as a member. So part of the, um, the New York stock exchange is called the Euro next group of the exchange. And it sells, you know, one year trading licenses to trade directly on the exchanges. And in 2018, the cost of a license was $50,000 per license. Um, so, it's uh, it's set up old school is how I would describe the New York Stock Exchange. So it's 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 rooted you know a hundred over a hundred years ago, and um, so it had to evolve through time. So the stock exchange has some legacy um, issues to it that, uh, but I think most people are familiar with the floor in the New York Stock Exchange, which is shown on most financial news programs, which is a pretty large area where trading activity occurs. So it, it looks pretty similar today to you'd say, you know, 40, 50 years ago with trading posts and then you have certain traders around each post. So you have, you know, electronic gear around the perimeter and screens and monitors and people are buying and selling, uh, putting in buy and sell orders on the floor uh, back again. So this is sort of a old school approach to have this dealer's mark, this, um, this broker floor. Now, it's not actually required or needed. They can do all their trading electronically. And, you know, during times of crisis, they've had to shut down the floor, but still maintain an open market. So they can fully train, trade electronically, but sometimes they like this show of this, this broker floor because it does really enhance the brand of the company. So uh, ECNs, we already talked about, um, and this is just an alternative trading network. We already covered this. So moving ahead. Okay, so let's look at the market shares of trading in New York, New York Stock Exchange listed shares. So here we have the blue line is the New York Stock Exchange. So here's the number, the, the market percentage of market share. And if we look through the time horizon from 2002 to 2011, uh, we see this decline in the New York Stock Exchange. But then we can also look at, these are some other exchanges in here. Um, now this, this big decline, this was the stock market kind of bubble in here. And we see this decline in the percentage, the market share percentage, as these other markets have been uh, developed and took some of their market share away from their trades. Uh, in addition, the number of shares, out, the number of stocks outstanding have also decreased in this time period as well. So let's talk about, um, something high frequency trading and a logarithmic trading as well. So algorithmic trading is using computer programs to make trading decisions. Um, so more than half of all equity trade volume in the U.S. is believed to be initiated by computer programs. And these trades are, you know, they make uh, very fast trades and very small discrepancies in security prices. They entail, you know, a lot of cross rapid cross price comparisons, looking for some sort of price advantage. So strategies that normal individual people uh, with fingers and hands can't make, but computers can take advantage of. Now, this is how a lot of hedge funds make their money. And specifically this high frequency trading um, is gonna be an ultra fast um, algorithmic trading that relies on computers to execute these orders. So there's high frequency traders um, they use highly sophisticated computer-based uh, trading uh, strategies to analyze markets and execute orders uh, on market conditions. So usually moving in and out of positions within seconds or fractions of a second. So traders use um, these computer programs um, to, buy, to buy or sell orders uh, into many, they can break the orders to many small orders and offer to minimize the impact because the, the supply and demand are gonna shoot up the, 
bid and ask prices on big orders. So they're going to bring them down to very small orders to minimize the impact of trading large quantities of shares. So they can trade large quantities of shares, but they're able to break it down to smaller uh, bits or shares so as not to really um, move up the uh, share price too quickly on the bid and the ask. So it allows traders to, you know, to speculate on price movements. So today's high tech you know, world, these financial markets make it possible for um, this high frequency trading firms to execute more than 10,000 trades in a single second. And you know, the more trades means more profits. So these you know, high frequency trading accounts uh, for about you know, 50% even of some days of the trading in the United States and Europe. So this large and growing number of high frequency strategies, mostly deployed by hedge funds, uh, have caused some uh, legislators and regulators to question is how appropriate is this? And is it fair to the individual investors? So um, we had a flash trading, uh, which is you know, how we call this high frequency trading, we can call it flash trading. Um, you know, so you know, the information to buy and sell these orders in fractions of seconds occur far faster than any individual human could do with their hands and the keyboard. So the high frequency trading firms, they have an advantage, this informational advantage they can use to trade ahead of um, the small investors. So critics argue that this can be, you know, something called front running, which is, the, you know, an investment company strategy based on information uh, coming out and then them trading faster than an individual could trade using computer, computerized platforms. So uh, this is something that you know, would be illegal for brokers to do if they had uh, advanced information of information and act on it before uh, individual people can act on it. So this high frequency trading is you know, controversial, but it's a way that computers have been leveraged and in some cases AI has been leveraged to um, make a lot of profits. Let's move on to the next slide. So what are dark pools? And dark pools sound kind of scary uh, when you think about it. It's sort of an ominous title. Now, when we look at uh, dark pools, uh, before I mention dark pools, I do want to mention that, you know, there, because of this, all this computerized trading, we had this flash crash that occurred where um, somebody tried to fake out the system by putting a huge, a very large order in the system. Um, to, to basically a $4 billion sale order that they quickly retracted. But it was there momentarily, which enacted all the computerized trading to sell. And we had lost a thousand points within seconds on the New York, um, on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and that was quickly, once that order was withdrawn and they realized the computers had made a mistake, traders came in and, and, and put the market back up. So within you know a short time period, we had this, decrease of the New York Stock Exchange by a thousand points and then shooting back up a thousand points all in one day because of this anomaly with the computerized trading. We call that the flash crash of 2010. So now talking about dark pools, uh, many uh, large traders, they want to they want to trade with some secrecy and they don't want others to see what they're buying or selling for fear that they're going to be copied. And the public was going to basically use that information to move against them. So very large traders, um, can make blocks or trades up to 10,000 shares. And, you know, so if they want to trade these, they want to um, hopefully trade it in a way that's a little bit more secret as far as who the trader is. So these brokers want to discreetly arrange these large orders out of where the public can see them to avoid any huge price movements uh, for their clients. So say someone wants to buy 10,000 shares of Google, that just placing that order in the marketplace would, would really shoot up prices. So, uh, Block trading today can be uh, displaced by these dark pools, which are a trading system in which participants can buy or sell large blocks of securities without showing their hands. So, a limit, so it's not visible, the limit order is not visible to the general public, um, and traders' identities are kept private. Uh, so largely, mostly large, only large traders are going to want to utilize these dark pools to make, it less, uh, make them less vulnerable to the high frequency trading programs. Uh, now, it's somewhat controversial, these dark pools, because they seem unfair that a small investor can't know about it, but they contribute to, you know, um, the fragmentation of the marketplace where many orders are moved, are removed or consolidated into, like, into a limit order book that, are, you know, so it, it can be confusing how they maneuver around 
these blocks to keep them private. And it does to me seem a little suspect and not very uh, transparent. But nonetheless, these dark pools are what we call it when large investors want to move in and out of stocks, um, you know, to gain some privacy. Okay, so the globalization of stock markets. So as markets move to more electronic trading, trading tends to be um, result in this 24 hour global market. If you move from, you know, um, trading would first start in Europe and then, well, actually, you could think of it trading first starts in Asia, then Europe, then the United States. And so if you go around the globe, you have a market open all, every hour of the full 24 hour day. And that helps to consolidate. And, uh, and integrate world news. So it's not just the US trading hours. Now it's more of a globalized global trading system. Um, and we can see that as far as the capitalization of the exchanges, still the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange have the largest amount of capitalization in the trillions, followed by a number of, another of exchanges uh, throughout the world. And you can see how the US, two big US exchanges make up a majority of the trades. Uh, so let's talk about uh, commissions and the bid and the app. So this is high finance, so everybody's gonna make some money. So what we have here is um, the commission is what is gonna be paid to the broker or for making the transaction. So the broker is gonna get commission. Now, so think of your broker as a person who's gonna facilitate the trade for you. So they're gonna get a commission from connecting you to the market, which you can't do individually. Now the spread is what's gonna be the cost for the dealer. So the dealer is gonna get the difference between the spread, the bid and the ask. So there's gonna be, um, this money is what compensates the markets for giving you access and facilitating your trades. And in some cases it could be a relatively small amount of money, in some cases it could be a large amount of money. Now, a lot of brokers have moved to lower commissions or free commission schedules to, to entice your business and the spreads have gotten tighter because of the increased activity and the increased volumes of share trading. So it's never been cheaper, uh, the cost tra trading transactions as it has been today, because you know I remember um, 30 years ago when I used to trade, I could pay $70, $75 for commission and then have spreads as large as a dollar between the bid and the ask. So it's become much more efficient and much more cheaper uh, transactional cost wise to trade stock today, which makes only increases in the frequency and the volumes of trade being made. So now let's move into and talk about margin and how that affects trades. Okay, so margin. Now, uh, securities don't have to be um, made at 100% of your cash, which we call equity. So when we talk about equity, this is the cash that you provide for an investment. Now, through margin trading, investors can use funds that they borrow from their broker uh, to help us increase the leverage or the size of the transaction. So this activity we're gonna to refer to as margin trading. So it's one of the basic reasons um, that investors can enhance returns is through enhancing the leverage by borrowing some money of their transaction uh, from their broker. So, let's just break this down in more simple terms. You have $1,000 you want to invest. You want to buy $2,000 worth of a stock. So you, you bring your $1,000 to the table and then the broker will give you a, a loan at an at a interest rate for $1,000. So your total uh, purchase will be $2,000 worth of stock, but you're only putting $1,000 of your money in and you're borrowing the rest from the broker. So this doubles your position. So if the if this stock goes up 10%, you're gonna make um, $200, which is more than if you only owned $1,000 worth of the stock, you would have made only $100 if the market went up 10%. So thereby you can double your returns by accessing um, borrowed money from your broker. So we like this magnification of returns, but it also comes at a magnification of losses if things go the other way. Now, so, we're, Margin is going to refer to your money, the percentage of equity or cash you put in the transactions, not to the amount of the money you borrowed. So uh, now the margin percentage that is up to the broker and there's a minimum, there's minimums and maximums that are set, you know, as far as, you know, how the federal, in the U.S., the Federal Reserve will set 
the margin requirements for a specific minimum. And typically the margin requirement for stocks has been set to 50%, meaning that you can't uh, borrow more than 50% of the total transaction. So if the transaction total is $10,000, the most you can borrow is 5,000 or 50%. So um, now they, Fed can, they can change these margin require, requirements, uh, although they haven't done so in a really long time. And brokers can also approve of, since they're lending you the money, they approve of how much money they're gonna lend you in the transaction. They may not even wanna lend you the full 50% uh, because a broker wants to protect the money they lent you. Now the use of margin um, is you know, gonna magnify returns or magnify losses. So there is a, there's an enhanced amount of risk here when you borrow on margin and also you have the, you know, the ability um, for the, the loan to be called back if things get too risky. We'll talk about that later. So the initial margin requirement, which we can call the, M the IMR, is going to be set by the Federal Reserve in the U.S. and it's kind of, it can't be more than 50%. So the minimum percentage initial investor equity is going to be one minus the, the IRM. So this is the max amount you can borrow. So it's going to be 50%. Now, moving to the next slide, your equity, how you calculate your equity is going to be the total value of the position, say the $10,000 position, minus the money you borrowed, uh, plus any additional cash you brought into the transaction is, would be your equity. So there's something called a margin maintenance requirement, the MMR. So this is the minimum amount of equity that can be... Um, before additional funds must be put into the account. So they might set you up initially at 50%, but if your equity falls below 30%, then they're gonna require you to put some extra cash into the position. And exchanges you know, usually have a, a mandated minimum where the, the MMR can't, can't be any lower than 25%. So you have a little leeway before there's some sort of, before there's a margin call. So if, it, if, if your equity percentage falls to 25%, then your broker is going to you know, ask for additional funds. And if you don't have the additional funds, they're going to sell your position. And that margin call is what can make markets very volatile. If the markets go down quickly and people can't cover their margin calls, then the broker is going to sell the stock in order to refund the amount of loan they lent you, leaving you with zero. Um, now, to calculate the equity slash market value of your position, you can just do the the... So if you want to calculate your what we call your margin percentage or your um, we're going to look at the stock value minus the money borrowed divided by the stock value. So with market value means the current price, the current market value, and this will give you a percentage. So a margin call would be whenever your uh, your money is there's a specific stock price at which the margin call will happen at. So it's going to, occur, going to occur when the the borrowed the money borrowed is when you divide it by one minus the MMR is going to be greater than the market value and then you're going to get a margin call and the brokers want you to bring more money into the account. Now, so you can see that you do have this advantage of increasing or decreasing increasing your uh, profitability through leverage, but also the disadvantage of increasing your liability. So. Um, so this initial margin that we were talking about, this is when you first open up the transaction and you can borrow up to 50% of the total transaction as this initial margin. And then the maintenance margin, which is the absolute minimum amount of, of equity or margin that investor has to maintain in the account at all times. So sometimes it's referred to as a, a maintenance margin. Uh, and the margin call is going to occur whenever the maintenance, you breach this maintenance margin percentage that the broker is going to want additional funding to help shore up the position. So the idea is that the broker never wants to be um, vulnerable or, or lose the money they lent you. So that's why they're going to call back the share. So if we look at this particular example, X Corp, the stock price is 70, initial margin is 50, margin of maintenance is 40%, which could be set by the broker anywhere between 25 to 50%. Uh, they could decide that based on their your risk. So a thousand shares purchased. So the initial position is seventy thousand shares. You can borrow thirty five thousand, and you put thirty five thousand dollars up on that position. So let's say what if the stock price falls to sixty dollars per share? So now if we look at uh, the position value is going to be sixty thousand, 
minus the $35,000 borrowed plus any additional cash. So if we want to calculate the margin percentage at this point, we look at the uh, your equity value is now dropped to 25,000 because the stock price went from 70 to 60,000. So that 10,000 loss comes out of your equity. So if you divide your equity by the total position, you're now your margin percentage is 41%. So if you want to see how far the, um, the price of the overall stock can fall before you're getting a margin call, you just take your the amount you borrow divided by one minus the margin maintenance and at um, $58 a share or a total of $58,000 for the position is where your margin call would be developed. So at $58.33, if I divide it by the outstanding shares, this is where the point at which the, the brokers are going to say add more money. So if we did our margin percentage, our, your equity at, you know, at $58 is going to fall to $23. So, oh no, if we do a, a margin percentage at 40%, that means that if you take the current uh, share price of at the $58 amount, your equity is only 23,000. Divided by the current uh, market price of 58,000, it's a 40% margin. So to restore the, the, the uh, position, you're gonna have to bring in more additional cash um, so if you want to get back to one half percentage, you're going to need to bring your account up to, from 23 to 29,000, uh, to satisfy the broker. So buying on margin, if the stock price increased by 30%, you're going to get, uh, so the ending value of your shares, repayment of principal plus interest, you get a 51% return on the 30% increase. And if there's no change in the stock price, you lose 9%, which is your, your principal on your interest your interest on your principal, I should say. And if the stock price decreases by 30%, you lose 69%. So that's the magnification of returns. So let's now move into uh, short sales. So short selling a stock. Now this is something that you're not used to because you're used to buying something and then selling it later. So that's not natural to you because you always buy things and then sell them. Or um, so, But stock markets allow for this transaction where you can sell first and buy back later. So it's a kind of unique concept that most traders have a hard time with before they actually uh, make, you know, make these trades and see how it works. So that's why if you're participating in the voluntarily, voluntary stock analysis game, try some short selling to see how this works, get a better feel for it. Now, so in most cases, investors buy stock hoping that the price will increase. Um, but what if you expect the price to decrease during, say, a bear market or potential bad news coming? Then you would want to use short selling. So this might be this is a way to profit from falling prices. And if you've seen, if you study any of the stock market crashes, prices can fall much faster than they increase. So it might take uh, two years to go from a Dow at eighteen thousand or sixteen thousand to uh, twenty nine thousand, but then may only take. Um, 15 trading days to go back to 18,000. So it took two years to climb up. It's sort of like climbing up uh, a mountain takes a long time and then falling down the mountain is very quick. So short selling is a way to make money very quickly in the right market conditions. So any type of stock can be shorted. Um, you know, and this is basically um, investors who feel that the stock price is going to go down in the future want to set up a short position. So uh, short selling is defined as the practice of selling borrowed shares. So it sounds unusual. So how, how do you borrow shares and sell them? So in most cases that the stock investor has a brokerage account. And the brokerage account has an inventory of stock that all of the members of the account or customers of the account have shares of stock that are placed in the broker's name, not in your actual name. So the broker can borrow shares from another shareholder and that they're holding the shares for and lend them to you to sell the people who own the stock have no idea this is happening uh but it's happening all the time and the broker guarantees the shares in case anything so you never notice that they're gone and the broker will replace them if you want to sell them and they'll just basically play this game where they're just moving stock around different accounts to facilitate the ability to create a short sale so the borrowed shares um 
you know, the broker is going to ensure that the borrowed shares are always paid back, but they're going to temporarily lend you them to you to make a short position. So when the prices fall, you're going to make a profit. Now, um, so just to reiterate, the, um, the brokers can lend securities because their portfolios of all the stock that they're holding for their clients are what's called the street name. So they basically are holding the, the stock shares for you. So that's why they're able to um, take these shares and lend them to somebody else. And you're agreeing to that, that functionality when you sign up their, to their brokerage account. Now, so this is how it works. You borrow stock from somebody else, you sell it, and then later you, you buy it back to close the position. And then the stock price falls within that time period, you have made money. And you, you can also do the short selling on a margin account. So, you know, so an investor must make a deposit with the broker equal to the initial margin requirements we discussed earlier is 50%. So then the short sell proceeds uh, are gonna be, you know, have to be affected by some interest of the position on the loan. So you can use margin with short sell positions. Now, um, again, the initial margin is gonna be 50%. And uh, for most stocks, now, if there's any um, dividends on the stock, you're going to be li liable for any of those cash flows. Um, so typically, if you sell a stock short, you're not going to be collecting dividends. You'd be paying dividends. And there is this uh, zero tick or uptick rule that was you know, put in place by the SEC to help limit the effect of short selling on the downward movement of stock prices. So that's something just to kind of keep in mind. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages, of course, to uh, short selling because, you know, it can be very dangerous because the if the stock price keeps increasing, there's unlimited losses that you could face with a short sold position. So it puts you in a more riskier uh, point of view. So you have you have limited returns. You can only make as much as for the stock price to go to zero, but you have unlimited losses. So that's why in short selling is very risky. And since the stock market tends to go up more than it goes down, most of the time short sellers are not gonna make a lot of money. That's why short selling is usually dominated into a few key stocks where it's a high likelihood that the stock prices are gonna go down. Okay, so let's look at, you know, you sell 100 shares short of a stock, at $60 per share. So $600 must be pledged to the broker, you're going to put up three thousand dollars or fifty percent of your equity. So now there there is um, nine thousand dollars in the margin account. Okay, so it's sort of like your you pledge six thousand to the broker for this transaction, but you also put up another three thousand margin to kind of uh, protect the position. So the short sale uh, equity is going to be the total margin account minus the market value. So example, if we put some money behind this. The, the margin maintenance of the short value of the stock we can set to it has to be greater than $16.75, which is the market value. So it's going to be $1,800. So you have $1,200 of excess margin that can be utilized to protect or hold the position. Um, and then as far as a margin call, if the equity falls below 30% uh, times the market value, then the total, the equity, you know, you're going to probably face a margin call. So the total equity account minus the market value I'm sorry, the total margin account minus the market value will be your equity. So if the total margin account divided by one minus the MMR, we discussed earlier, the, the, the margin minimum requirement, that's going to show the market value of, say, 6923 So if the stock uh, price goes up to beyond $69,000, you're going to face uh, a market call on the short position. Um, so if this occurs, you're going to have to um, restore uh, about $1,384 into the account to maintain the short position. So you can see how a short position is sort of a pain because you have to uh, maintain enough margin uh, to protect the broker so they don't lose money on your transaction. Okay, so let's look at cash flows from purchasing versus short selling. So here we buy shares um, and then you know, the cash flow is going to be, we're going to lose money in the initial price. It's going to be cash outflow, but the cash inflow will be whatever the ending price is plus dividends. On the short sale, 
we're going to basically, when you borrow shares, you're going to sell it in sort of an initial cash inflow because you're selling the stocks. You still get this info. You can't spend it, though. And when the, when the position is uh, closed out, you're going to owe whatever the ending price is plus any dividends during that period. So it's almost the inverse or the exact opposite of a buy action. So buy action, buying stock is sometimes referred to as a long position. And selling stock first is, is looked at as a short position. So the cash flows are, are um, going to be reversed the, uh, for short sales versus the, the long transactions. Now let's look at the regulation of the stock markets. Okay, so we have a, um, this is our last slide. So we're almost over here. So just look at, let's just talk about how the security markets are regulated. So this is something that because of past fraud and past um, illegal actions taken by unscrupulous um, investors took advantage of shareholders, the SEC has come up with some regulations to protect shareholders. So it started all back during the Great Depression. So during the Great Depression, the Securities Act of 1933 was uh, created to create the SEC, Security Exchange Commission, to overlook the, the, the financial markets. So the, the, um, in 1934, the SEC is, is you know, established and given the power to regulate the exchanges. Uh, then in 1940, they're, they're given the power to regulate and monitor mutual funds. And then also in 1940, they're given the power to, the SEC is given the power to regulate and to monitor um, investment advisors because then it turned out investment advisors could be unscrupulous and lie to investors and encourage them to get into transactions that with misinformation. So to ensure more ethic, ethics and, social, and responsibility for investment analysts, um, investment advisors specifically, they made their able, SEC is able to register them and monitor their activities. Uh, the Securities Act's amendments of 1975 is what we talked about earlier to abolish the fixed trading commission schedule and also cr uh, open up and create more ele electronic trading networks. Then in 1988, the Insider Trading and Fraud Securities Act was enacted to protect investors against insider trading and more tighten up the rules and regulations and laws against insider trading. Then 19, and in 2000, a fair or a regulation fair RF was distributed, was established to make sure that companies fairly disclose material or information to all investors at the same time. Then the, so the insider trading in 2000, this regu regulation FAIR, R RF regulation, was set up to protect investors from insider trading. So insider trading is basically when investors uh, have information that's not known to the general public. So somehow they got information that might be possessed by officers or major owners of, of companies with privilege, and they use this information to trade before the markets are, the normal participants in the markets know this information. So you can see how very unfair that is to know something in advance and trade on it when the regular shareholders don't know it. Now, the Sorbanes-Oxley Act, it was passed in 2002, and this is to protect investors against corporate fraud, particularly accounting fraud. So they created an oversight board to monitor the accounting, act, the accounting industry, tighten audit regulations and controls, and tighten, uh, toughen penalties against executives who commit corporate fraud, uh, strengthen accounting disclosure requirements, ethical guidelines for financial officers, establish a corporate board structure and membership guidelines, establish guidelines for analysts uh, for, that might have conflicts of interest, and increase the SEC's authority uh, and budgets for auditing and investigating uh, any, any company or person they feel might be uh, unethical, and uh, mandated instant disclosure of stock sales by corporate executives. So this was something that was created to make the, uh, based on the shenanigans that went on with accounting companies and audit companies in the early 2000s. You know, we had Enron and WorldCom and, and Quest, all these companies did bad things. This Sorbanes-Oxley was enacted to try to make this, uh, not these uh, basically lies to trick shareholders that they couldn't easily occur anymore that audited companies really had to stand behind their audits. So something not mentioned here that we should talk about would be the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010. And this was an act as basically a reaction to the financial crisis and it's aimed at 
ways to promote the financial stability of the United States by improving accountability and transparency, and it created the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection and other agencies to help uh, protect consumers from unscrupulous mortgage lending or um, uh, some of the causes of the Great Recession is meant to counteract that. Okay, so that's the last slide. A couple of things that um, is important is that, you know, markets are complex and, you know, the trading, uh, typically active live trading for the U.S. occurs at 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m., but other markets and other markets around the world can trade at different hours. Uh, you have to also keep in mind that the there is, um, a, you know, a complexity to the market, whether it's in the bull or bear fra uh, frame, frame of mind. A bull is stock prices moving up, a bear is stock prices moving down. So there's a lot to, you know, consider when you're, you know, thinking about investing in the market. It's a pretty complex environment with a lot of moving parts. So, and a lot of risk involved. So short-term trading or day trading is very risky where people try to make a profit just on daily trades. And that's something that I know not recommended. I've never met a day trader who consistently made uh, a lot of money in the long term. Uh, maybe short term they're profitable here and there, but one you know stock market crash or bear market, they pretty much lose all their profits or positions. So this is things that you know you want to be careful of. Don't get uh, lured into the you know uh, greediness of the market and the potential to make what you think are really fast or easy money. There you know. You can be fooled by the market based on particular times in the market. So you just want to be cautious of how you trade. But I do encourage everybody to open up their own brokerage account. Maybe put a little bit of money in a brokerage account. You don't have to buy any stock, but just establishing a brokerage account. So when you do have more money in the future, you can um, more easily buy and sell stocks or mutual funds or bonds to get more involved in the marketplace and you pick a discount broker, someone's going to have low commissions and low fees, and you, you know, sort of establish your, your brokerage account fund with a little bit of money. You can put it in a safe investment, and generally you're going to receive more money than a savings account anyway. So I would say at the end of this particular um, lecture, take the time to look at different brokerage accounts and the, the advantages and disadvantages for you, and maybe establish a brokerage account now. So that when you do want to trade a stock, you already have the brokerage account set up. You can fund it with money and begin trading when you're ready. Okay, thank you for your time. I hope you found this interesting and uh, helpful lecture. I'll talk to you soon.